verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not only live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. know that we kind of hit certain stops along the way in our faith journey. Amen? Now y'all know I like y'all to talk, so I know it's been a while. Let's so just get back and pray now. Um, but what God does, does during the stops, and I was really drawn to this particular text, a, a pretty familiar text, a passage of scripture where Jesus, of course, uh, is tempted in the wilderness. But as I was preparing, um, and even yesterday and today, some other pieces to this story uh, sort of came to mind. So I actually want to read a few verses right before where we started, uh, and, then, and then we'll get started. So actually in chapter 3, starting with uh, verse uh, 16, what's happening is Jesus is actually getting baptized, right? He's with his cousin, John the Baptist, and uh, John is baptizing Jesus. And in verse 16 it says, And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Verse 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this moment of worship, for what you're doing in and through us gathered here this evening. God, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. May we be good ground that your, your word is sown in tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we give you thanks. The people of God said, Amen. Amen. So what God does during the stops. So I wanted to read the part from the baptism because it, it says that there's really this amazing moment that happens right before Jesus is sent into the wilderness. He's getting <coughs> baptized. Many of us here have probably been baptized. I don't remember mine, seeing as how I was like six months old. Um, but several of us, and some of you may actually remember your own baptism when it happened. Um, and Jesus is being baptized, but when it happens, uh, it says when he comes up, that the, the heavens open up to him. And the spirit descends like a dove, and then a voice from heaven said, This is my son with whom I will please. Um, you know, it's kind of a dramatic scene. I don't know if you had like noticed that. Did that happen to anybody's baptism? I, I don't remember mine, seeing as I was an infant, but I'm pretty sure the heavens didn't open up. And now maybe the spirit descended. We want to believe God that the spirit descended, right? But there was no voice saying, This is my child with whom I will please. Well, this is what happens at Jesus' baptism, and that's significant for this passage we're going to look at tonight. Although I suspect that when we read even about Jesus' baptism, this moment, this awesome moment, is kind of lost on us. Because you got to remember that we're reading the story backward, kind of, right? I mean, we come to the text 
kind of someone already having told us how this is all going to turn out. That in fact Jesus is the God, right? He's going to go off and do all these awesome things. He's going to heal some people and raise the dead and do this great stuff. And he's going to die on the cross and save the world from their sins and be resurrected on the third day and awesome. Awesome, all this awesome stuff. So when we come to the text, we're not exactly blown away, right, that there's this announcement being made from heaven that this is my son with whom I am well pleased. But if you can shift your mind back just for a moment to what it might have been like that day, uh, you know, Jesus was just out here living his life, right? Um, to most people around him, he was just that kid from Nazareth. You know, Mary and Joseph's boy. Nobody particularly special. Um, now, maybe John had a sense of who he was. Maybe he had a sense of who he already was. His parents obviously had a little inkling, you know, the whole, like, virgin birth thing. Um, but it, he was just a regular person, right, to, to most people around. You know, if he had been current day, maybe, you know, he'd have a few followers, a few hundred followers on Snapchat. You know, <laughs> maybe he liked to hang out, grab coffee with his friends at the park or whatever. Um, and maybe he just, you know, did a little work as a carpenter with his dad. And one day he's hanging out with his cousin and he has this baptism and this big awesome moment happened. happened. Now, of course, there had been glimpses about who Jesus was and what his life was really going to be about before. But this moment, the baptism, sort of ignites something. And his story, his journey, takes sort of a different turn, right? He's not just the carpenter's kid anymore, right? Now, he maybe has a little something else going on in his life. And whatever that is, though no one may know yet, it has surely begun. And I wonder, have you ever had that kind of feeling? Have you ever had a moment like that? You know, when, when something shifted or something maybe big and loud and noisy happened or maybe something quiet and calm and sort of a still small voice spoke to you, but something happened um, and you got some clarity about your life. Maybe you figured out where you wanted to go to college. Or maybe you figured out what you wanted to major in or what you wanted to do with your life or what kind of program you would pursue or job you would pursue after you leave here. Uh, or maybe you found the one that you think you want to love forever, right? Perhaps God spoke to you and confirmed some things to you about a choice you were about to make. Or maybe you got some insight into how God sees this incredible awesomeness in you and all the things that God wants to do in and through you. I want you to think about a moment in which maybe something has happened when you got a new perspective, a, a new way to think about life, a, a new chapter was about to begin for you. Or maybe it was just as simple as a new semester, whatever it was. Um, there is a moment, we have to hit these moments sometimes where something shifts and who we were uh, or who we understood ourselves to be or who other people understood ourselves us to be is shifting. And I want to suggest tonight that when we hit these moments, these sort of moments where things are changing, we don't want to totally blow right past them. Rather, we want to recognize them for what they are and realize that it's an opportunity for us to prepare for what is coming next. Look at what happens. Further down in the scripture, Jesus actually launches his ministry. Uh, next thing he does is he gathers his team that he picks his disciples out, and then he climbs this big mountain and preaches this really long sermon and essentially launches his ministry, right? It takes off after this point. And of course, and once he gets going, he's going, right? He's, he's on his mission. Um, he's preaching. He's teaching. He's picking up followers and supporters and some haters, you know. He's healing people, and he's ultimately doing the work that is going to save the entire human race. But that moment at the baptism represents a major shift, a start, a pivotal moment in his life. And at this moment of baptism, there's this incredible affirmation where a voice from heaven claims him as his son. But the question becomes, what is the link between the two, right? This moment of baptism, hey, you're great, you're my son, I think you're awesome, right? To getting the ministry started. What's the moment, what's that stop, that space in between there? But what's interesting is that the text says that the same spirit which Jesus received at his baptism sent him into the wilderness to be tested. And it's like, well, man, that good moment didn't last too long, right? I was just coming out the water, it was great, the heavens opened, and the spirit descended, and all this, and suddenly, the Jesus is sent into. 
the wilderness. And it's something about this wilderness experience that is somewhat of a stop, a pause, a moment of spiritual preparation, if you will. It's that time that we have set aside to get ready for the change that is about to take place in our story. And let's look at what happens there. The text says that while in the wilderness, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and many of us will understand fasting to be a spiritual discipline, right? And the text is not, does not say specifically why he did this. We only can infer that he understood, understood that he needed to be present with God, with God his Father in a new way. He needed to engage in his own practice of devotion and faith. And throughout the Gospels, actually, you see Jesus do things like step away to go pray. Or say he went off somewhere by himself to pray. So he was always engaging and practicing his faith. And I think we would do well to take note of what Jesus does here. There's something really powerful about pausing to get some clarity and build up your spiritual strength before taking on a new challenge or starting a new chapter. Many other biblical personalities did the same thing. Esther, Joshua, Paul, Elijah, and the list goes on and on and on. They take a moment to pause, get close to God, and build up their strength and prepare for what's next. But there's still this question hanging before us about why is it that the Spirit sends Jesus into the wilderness to be tested by the devil? Doesn't this seem weird? Like you were just claiming me. Why am I suddenly headed off into the wilderness to be tested? Well, in order to understand this piece, we need to know what's really happening in the text and who's really involved. Now, the text says that Jesus is tempted by the devil. And often when we use that term, that name, the devil, we, we may say other words like Satan or accuser, um, but we associate that right with this ultimate like, prince of evil, this fallen angel who is constantly at work trying to put evil in our way and throw it our direction, right? Um, however, scholars suggest that we should think about the Hebrew Bible's use of that term, the accuser. This, in that context, is someone who is really representative of the heavenly court, right? Somebody on God's staff, in other words. Um, not this Satan that we often think of, but somebody sent on a divine mission to test us, to prepare us, to get us ready. And so, uh, so actually what's under this text is there's someone being sent on God's behalf to do God's will, actually, and to prepare Right to actually test Jesus, to put him to the test, to get him ready for what is to come. And this one, again, sent by God to do God's work. And what happens when this accuser shows up is Jesus is able to perfectly demonstrate his commitment, his faith, and ultimately his obedience to the Father. He had an opportunity to demonstrate, to show just how serious he was about the call and mission on his life. And when we have these moments, these pauses in life, when it's just about to make a turn, we're about to start the new chapter, do the new thing, God has to know that we are able to be obedient. God needs to be able to trust us with the message and the mission that God has given us. And every time, notice that this accuser challenges Jesus, he responds with scripture. And it's as if to say, listen, I know who I am and what I am called here to do. And it's not to be out here doing silly stuff like turning these stupid stones into bread, okay? Can I do it? Yes. Duh. <laughs> Later, I'm going to turn, take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000 people. So do I have the power to do it? Absolutely. But I'm not here to be pushed by whatever your agenda is. But I am here to always be obedient to my father. I will perform miracles, but only when God says so. And of course, he does that throughout his ministry. The thing is, we all want to do great things for God. We want to do great things in the world and for our families. We want to all be successful. We want to, we, and so we often pray things and ask God to make us productive, right? To help our lives to mean something because we want to make a difference. We want to help others. And those are all honorable, wonderful things. But it really starts with getting present with God uh, and allowing God to sure us up, to develop our faith, to make us strong, to cultivate a spirit of obedience in us, to deepen our understanding. 
We live in a world that is constantly telling us to go, 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 go. Start the business, go after your dreams, pursue your passion. And all that's fine to do, but it's all in vain if we have not asked God to lead us in the journey. And so really, it all starts with a stop. In this stop, in this moment that we are present with God, once God has anointed us, called us, commissioned us, told us who we are, that this is what you're here to do, I'm going to bless you and be with you, all those great moments of affirmation we sometimes experience in faith journey, we want to make sure we follow that up with a moment, a space, a pause, where we can be present with God and allow God to cultivate us, to develop us, to strengthen our faith, to help us, to grow us and make us more obedient. The truth of the matter is that Jesus accomplished all he was sent here to accomplish. But you know he did that because of obedience. That's how he was able to do it. In fact, we are all sitting in this room as Christians or wanting to be Christians or trying to understand what it is to be a Christian simply because Jesus was obedient to his father even to the point of death. And so that same model of obedience that Jesus gave us is the same one we want to live into. So when you are called to do something or there's a new chapter or a new challenge, because sometimes it's a challenge, right? Uh, believe me, whatever things that God has called you to, all of it will not be peaches and cream. There will be some things about it you don't like. This is why God has to get you ready for it. So don't brush past that moment. Embrace that moment. If it's like, but I know I'm supposed to be going, but stuff ain't popping out, things aren't going yet, that's okay. Because God is getting you ready for what is next. So sure you up, so to speak, on every leaning side. So as you all start this new semester, or as you make, take this new turn in your journey in life, as you walk into 2018 or into whatever God is calling you to in this season, make space for a stop, a pause. Jesus went to the wilderness and fasted. But maybe you will develop some other prayer practice. Maybe you'll do uh, solitude or vision boarding. I brought this because this actually is part of what inspired the sermon tonight. Uh, at the Chapel Stewart Retreat last week, we made these vision boards. And one that I found, this picture here, which is actually on the cover of your program tonight, says, it's the stops that inspire us to go. It's critical that we take those moments to stop and be present with God. So maybe for you, it's a practice of Sabbath, maybe it's journaling, spiritual reading, Lectio Divina, whatever it is, create that space and allow God to build you up. I'm not sure what your stop will look like, but be sure to make your stop and allow God in to do some work in you, to inspire you to go. Amen. Amen.